Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. This is Professor Jared Rathel. I would like to start our fourth unit entitled Structure and Function with a quote from the late and famed astrophysicist Stephen Hawking. He says, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. So this is a really important idea as we embark on this, our anatomy and physiology unit. Because sometimes we think we know something. Hell, <laughs> my kids at six and eight years old know everything. But it's this arrogance that can actually be an impediment to us gaining a deeper insight. For example, why do plants have flowers? Some might mistakenly believe that those flowers were put here for us so that we might express our love for one another like this adorable couple. That, my friends, is a human-centric view of the world. Following these lectures in 4-1, you're going to have the opportunity to watch a phenomenal movie. Dr. Michael Pollan's The Botany of Desire. So Pollan is one of my favorite natural history writers. He's out of UC Berkeley. The book of the same name, The Botany of Desire, is an awesome read. In this movie, Pollan is going to turn your human-centric view of the world on its head. For it is not us but it is the plants who are in control. The plants are using us. They're exploiting our desires, our desires for beauty, like you see in this tulip, for sweetness, for intoxication, for control, to take over the world. The plants are using us to propagate them all over the planet and spread their genes. For example, in Hawaiian culture, the plumeria symbolizes positivity, and it's used in lays to celebrate special occasions. Just so you know, the plumeria, when worn in the hair, has a very specific meaning. So it demonstrates the relationship status. A flower worn over the right ear indicates that the lady is available, whereas one over the left ear means that she is taken. The Orchidaceae, one of the most successful families of flowers in the world, with some 28,000 described species, in part because of us. A trip to the supermarket reveals many varieties of orchids that have been lovingly cultivated by human worker bees. This one was one of my favorites in northern Utah. I knew that I had made it through the cold and dark winter when my bleeding hearts first emerged in the yard in the spring. Similarly, we dote on our callow lilies, this showy and large flower. And from Japan to Washington, D.C., we celebrate the rebirth of spring with the glorious cherry blossom festivals. The Asteraceae, another wildly successful family of flowers, includes over 32,000 species. But I warn you, be careful of that illusion of knowledge. What you're looking at here is not one flower but a multitude of individual and complete flowers combined into a singular composite, a singular unit known as an inflorescence. And how could we not pay homage to what we call the rose? But remember William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, when Juliet argues, a rose by any other name 
would still smell as sweet. Regardless of culture, regardless of time period, we see this flower, its exquisite form, its fragrant smell, and we find it beautiful. How could these flowers not be put here for our enjoyment? Careful. Meet Titan Arum, one of the world's largest flowers with a bloom that can grow more than eight feet in height and four feet across in diameter. This rare tropical plant is native to the equatorial rainforests of Sumatra, Indonesia. The Titan Arum has a radically different approach than the rose. It's also called the corpse flower. I'm interested to see the stinky, corpsey smell. According to this brochure, a stinky plant. Well, said rotting meat, so I'm going to assume if it's in bloom, it's going to stink. We're displaying a Titan Arum. Uh, the Latin name for this plant is uh, Amorphophallus Titanum. It's a really awesome plant that was first discovered um, to Western science in the uh, late 1800s uh, by an Italian explorer in Sumatra, Indonesia. It's got this crazy, disgusting smell. Um, the, uh, in fact, the Indonesian name for the plant directly translates as corpse flower, um, and it smells like a rotting corpse. The peak smell usually comes within just a couple of hours of opening. So as soon as it's open enough, it starts generating the stench. Uh, and that peaks probably about three or four hours later. The way the flower works is it has uh, two rungs of flowers down in its base. And the female flowers are the first ones to start. And their strategy is to put the cattle call out uh, to every carrion fly, beetle, sweat fly. They think that they're running towards a rotting corpse, which is what they love. They like to eat them, they like to lay eggs in them, they like to have a great time in them. So it pulses that smell out to get insects in that hopefully already have pollen on them from a previous plant that was in the male cycle somewhere in the area. So they come in, the heat generates the smell, it's just overwhelmingly wonderful for them. The plant only releases the putrid smell for two nights. Um, the insects actually kind of get trapped inside the plant. And then the male flowers open up. It's already got the pollinators inside, it doesn't need to make any more smell. So after that first 12 hours, it's got what it needs in there. It starts raining pollen down on them, and then it can let them go. It kind of starts easing up after the flower's been open about 24 or 36 hours, and the beetles can escape again with pollen on them. It didn't smell that bad, actually. I didn't smell any really bad odor, but I guess it was if you got close enough. We weren't that close. It wasn't as strong as I thought it would be, but I could kind of smell it. It smelled like a mixture of uh, like maggots and really smelly feet. Fortunately for the public, the plant produces its most odoriferous um, emissions um, in the middle of the night from about midnight to 4 a.m., so nobody will be around. So during the day when the visitors come in, um, it's going to be just a, a bit less of that smell. And so it, people will smell it, and we have the plant is in a rather large greenhouse, and that'll dilute the smell a little bit, but people should be able to smell it no problem. Every now and then, I caught like a little whiff and went, whoa. Yeah. Well, also, I don't really, we don't really smell rotten flesh all that often. Just alone, it was cool to look at. <laughs> I love that kid at the end. So the corpse flower is emitting that putrid smell to lure carrion beetles and flies. Not to consume these insects the way the Venus fly traps and the sundews do, but to use these insects to spread their male gametes, to spread their pollen, like you see on the left. As beautiful as we may find them, we need to remember that the angiosperm flower has a very specific function or biological job. The angiosperm's flower is its reproductive shoot. It's how the angiosperms do sexual reproduction. So this unit 
we're going to be exploring that old adage in biology that form fits function. The angiosperm flower consists of a male part called the stamen. The stamen is composed of this stalk called the filament as well as the anther. The anther is where the male gametes, the pollen granules are produced, as well as a female part that we call the carpal or the pistil. The carpal consists of the sticky stigma. This is where the pollen grains land. The long style, this is the racetrack that the pollen tubes elongate down in a hurry to reach the ovary, this chamber that houses the ovules. The ovules are the female gametes. They contain the egg. In this unit, you will be trained to recognize that a biological structure is not random. Its form has been sculpted over eons by natural selection to perform a function, a biological job. Close observation of nature reveals that structure tells us about function. So we're going to be working as organismal biologists in this unit. In Bio 181, you spent an entire semester exploring macromolecules, organelles, and cells. In this unit, in 182, we'll be thinking about tissues, groups of cells that are working together to perform a specific function. The tissues comprise these units known as organs and collectively the organs formed organ systems. So we'll be working in this region. In 4-1, we'll be focused on the kingdom plantae. And then in 4-2, we'll think about animal organization and regulation. I hope you enjoyed the unit.